Welcome to Malifaux University. 910. Arcanist Starter Box. If you're a player new to Malifaux, you may have received a great deal of information and advice about which faction is best for beginners, which master or keyword wins the most tournaments, and more. This information is largely opinionated and will change rapidly over time. So at Malifaux University, we still recommend you look at the basic lore of the game and factions available on the Weird website and follow the rule of cool. That is, whatever looks cool, feels cool, or makes you say, oh cool, is the faction you should play, because you'll enjoy it the most and that's ultimately the point of the game. Each faction has a starter box with four models. The soulstone cost of the individual models will vary, but the entire crew will add up to 25 soulstones, which is perfect for a small game. The starter box also contains a unique faction-themed fate deck, 10 scheme markers with the faction's logo, a measuring widget, and all the general upgrades available to your faction. Let's talk about each of these before we get to the models. This Fate deck, while themed for the faction, is not the same as the regular Faction Fate deck you can purchase separately in the Weird Store. This one is unique to the starter box, which is pretty cool. These are paper cards, which means they're not necessarily the most durable, and if they get wet, they will take damage. If you'd like to make them last, you can buy standard size card sleeves from your friendly local game store in a variety of colors and styles. Just keep in mind that once you sleeve your cards, you won't shuffle them like a regular deck of cards. You'll blend the halves of the deck from the side five to seven times. If you shuffle them normally, you'll put creases in the sides of the sleeves and kind of wreck them. A cardstock sheet has ten scheme markers and the measuring widget. Punch them out carefully so you don't tear the design. These scheme markers do not need to go on plastic bases. They're already 30 millimeters across and ready for the table. You can use these with any crew in this faction you later decide to build. If you play against someone else with a crew in the same faction, you'll need to distinguish your scheme markers from his somehow, maybe by putting a coin on top of yours. The measuring widget is a fantastic tool that can stand in place of a measuring tape in most situations. It has one, two, three, and six inch sides. If you place the tool between two models, it makes it easy to tell if they're within one or two inches for engagement. If you need to measure an odd number like five inches, just lay down the three inch side of the widget, then rock it around the two inch corner like so. You'll also notice it has a 50 millimeter cutout. This is a surrogate blast marker. If you're unfamiliar, some game effects have this symbol, and when it appears, a model might suffer blast damage. You determine that by placing a 50 millimeter base over the area, usually in base contact with the original target model, and any models within the 50 millimeter blast area are affected. You can use this widget to measure that 50 millimeter diameter without having to place a 50 millimeter base on the table. Watch video 209 for detailed instructions on how to handle blast markers and damage. In the plastic sleeve with all the model stat cards are the general upgrades allowable by your faction. You can add these to your models before the game when you're hiring your crew with certain restrictions. Each upgrade adds abilities, actions, or both, so you might want to hold off on using them when you're first starting out. Once you get the hang of your models as they are, then switch things up with an upgrade or two. Later, when you're building other crews led by master models, you can still use these upgrades with other models in the same faction. Check out video 406 for detailed instructions on how to use upgrades. The models in the starter box are all pre-assembled. This means they are all molded at the factory and are each a single piece, so no assembly or other tools are required. The only thing you'll need to do is glue them onto their included bases. Check the base size on the bottom of the back of each stat card to make sure you put each model on the right base. You could use regular white glue, also called PVA glue, but you'll find it doesn't hold very well for long. Most players will use plastic glue to fuse the models to the bases, but this works only if it's plastic to plastic. If you create thematic bases out of cardstock, cork, wallpaper, or anything else, you'll probably have to use super glue. 
You'll quickly discover that Harrison Frodsham is the only one of these models that stands on his own two feet. Harris J5 has a giant wheel for its lower half, and the gearlings are off-center. Apply a dab of plastic glue where these models make contact with their bases, and then hold them carefully for about 30 seconds. Don't press hard or squeeze, and avoid repositioning the models if at all possible. You'll probably need to rest the models against another object to hold them in place while they dry. Once they're in place, let them sit for 24 hours to make a solid weld. Harris J5, due to his weight and small point of contact, may be better attached to its base with a pin, but this is a moderately advanced procedure involving drilling a small hole, inserting a metal rod, and gluing the model to the base with the pin as support. If you're not comfortable with all that, consider a dab of hot glue to help support its wheel. Once you have the models on their bases, you could put them on the table and get right to playing. When you can, though, you'll want to paint them according to your own unique style and preference. You might feel like you're not very good at painting models, but it's a skill that takes practice, and there are no better models to start on than your starter box models. There are countless YouTube channels, live streams, and other resources available to teach you how to paint, so we won't repeat that information here. Here's one way you might paint your models, and here are a couple more ideas, thanks to Kalatika and Spilled Paint Pot. You can see more of their excellent work on Instagram and elsewhere. Now that we've explored everything else in the box, let's get to the models. The Watchman keyword models were introduced in the Madness of Malifaux rulebook, so refer to that book for the lore and stories that go along with this crew. All four models have the Watchman keyword, so as long as range, line of sight, and other rules are satisfied, any ability or action that refers to a friendly Watchman model can be applied to any of them. Also take note that all four Watchmen models received updates in the July 2023 errata. If your cards don't say this on the back, you're working with outdated cards. You can always get the most current cards through the Malifaux Crew Builder app or from the resources page on the Weird website. Harrison Frodsham is the henchman who leads this crew. As a henchman, he is the only one of the Watchmen eligible to use Soul Stones. He has the unique A Cog in Its Place ability, which gives both crews a pass token during the start phase of each turn. The other part of this ability takes effect whenever either crew discards a pass token to skip activating a model. When that happens, Harrison can push a member of his crew that is within 8 inches of himself up to 2 inches. Since this is an aura which affects its source, Harrison could be the one you push with this ability, but since it says up to 2 inches, you could push a model 0 inches if you don't want to move any of them. The tricky part will be remembering to use this whenever you or your opponent skips an activation with a pass token, and then it applies only to models near Harrison. Also remember that some models discard pass tokens to pay for certain game effects. If a model does that, it would not apply to a cog in its place since it specifically says the pass token must be discarded to skip an activation. The Innocent Bystander ability makes it harder for models to use certain attack actions against him. First and foremost, this applies only to attack actions, which are on the top side of the back half of each model stat card. This ability says that attack actions that don't have a target number gain a target number of 12 when they target Harrison. Say that Bo Peep, the henchman leader of the Bayou starter box, attacks Harrison with her barbed whip attack action. Normally, she'd flip a card and add 5 to it, since that's her stat for this attack. Harrison would flip a card and add 5 to it, since that's his defense stat, and whoever got a higher number would win the duel. With his innocent bystander ability, Bo Peep would have a target number of 12 applied to this attack, so not only would her flip have to beat whatever Harrison flipped, it would also have to meet or exceed 12, which means she'd have to flip or cheat in a 7 or better. Say Harrison flipped a 5 for a total of 10, and Bo Peep flipped a 6 for a total of 11. Her attack would still fail unless she cheated in a 7 or better to meet her target number. Rewatch video 105 if you need a refresher on cheating fate, because there are very specific rules about it. 
Isochronism is an ability that all Watchman models have. It says that when another model within 6 inches gains a condition other than fast, this model may choose to gain the same condition. Generally, this means you'll want to copy only the helpful conditions like focused or shielded. It also can be used only once per activation, but keep in mind that could mean once during each activation. Since every Watchman model has it, multiple models could use this ability at the same time. Check this out. Harrison is near one of his gearlings and Klaus Norwood from the Neverborn starter box. Klaus hits the gearling with his sharp wit, giving the little minion the slow condition. Harrison does not want to be slow, so does not use his isochronism ability. However, Klaus Norwood got the cryptic message trigger, which gives him the shielded plus one condition. Both the gearling and Harrison have the isochronism ability, so they both choose to use it now to gain shielded plus one themselves. For his second action, Klaus takes the concentrate general action, which gives him the focused plus one condition. Since Harrison and the gearling both already use their isochronism ability during Klaus's activation, they cannot use it right now to gain focus. When the gearling activates and also takes the concentrate action to gain focus plus one, Harrison could use isochronism then to gain focus for himself, since now it's during the gearling's activation. First to speak is another ability that makes Harrison Frodsham harder to attack. This ability says that enemy attack actions that target him have a negative modifier if Harrison has already activated this turn. This means you may want to activate Harrison first among your models if you think your opponent is in a position to attack him, because then your opponent will have to flip two cards and take the lower of the two when attacking. Review video 104 for more details about positive and negative modifiers. Harrison's last ability is Time Moves Forward. This one takes effect when you declare that you're activating Harrison, but before you take any of his actions. Time Moves Forward lets Harrison end the slow condition on any member of his crew within 8 inches of himself. Since it's an aura, it also applies to Harrison, so if he has the slow condition, he can just shake it off when he activates. On the back of Harrison's card, we find his attack and tactical actions. Just like Klaus Norwood, Harrison Frodsham also has a sharp wit attack. This is a melee attack which gives Harrison a 1 inch engagement range. Since the resist stat is willpower, models he targets with this attack will add their willpower stat to their flipped card's value during the duel. This attack simply gives the target model the slow condition, but if Harrison flips, cheats in, or uses a soul stone to get a ram in the duel, he can declare the and the clock strikes midnight trigger to do damage equal to the turn number. He can use this trigger only once per turn, but in turn 3, for example, it'll do 3 points of damage, 4 points in turn 4, and 5 points of damage in turn 5. Naturally, you can use it during turns 1 and 2 as well, but still only once per turn. You can use the sharp wit attack as often as you'd like, it's just the trigger that is limited to once per turn. Spycraft is a pretty cool attack action that can be used only against enemy models. There are times when you might have reasons to use your attack actions on your own models, but this is one attack that cannot do that. It has an 8 inch range and is also resisted with willpower, but the interesting part is that you can draw line of sight and range from any member of your crew with the Watchman keyword. Let's say Harrison is on the table here, with this red cap 6 inches away. Clear on the other side of the board, a gearling is 5 inches away from Klaus Norwood. On Harrison's activation, he can use the spycraft attack against the red cap, drawing range and line of sight from himself as normal. Alternatively, he could attack Klaus Norwood, drawing range and line of sight from the gearling, even though there is half a table's worth of terrain between Harrison and the gearling. This attack also ignores concealment, so if the targeted model is on the other side of a fence or in a fog bank, this attack will not suffer the usual penalty. If the attack succeeds, the targeted model suffers up to 4 damage and the draw out secrets trigger from a tome in the duel 
will drop an Arcanist scheme marker into base contact with the targeted model. Further down the card we have Harrison's tactical actions. His first one is Gather Intel and has an 8 inch range. This action can only target friendly models, but remember that every model is friendly to itself, so Harrison could use it on himself. The rest of the text in italics says he can't use it more than once on the same model during a single activation, so he'll have to pick a different model if he wants to do it again in the same turn. This action has a target number of 10 and a stat of 5, so Harrison has to flip or cheat in a 5 or better to make it work. If it happens, the targeted model pushes up to 5 inches in any direction, even through other models, but not ignoring terrain. It doesn't do anything to the models it passes through, but enemy models within 2 inches and line of sight of the model after it stops must pass a willpower duel with a target number of 13, or else they gain distracted plus 1. The uncanny valley trigger on this action can be used if Harrison gets a mask in the duel when flipping to take this action, or by cheating, or using a soul stone. He can use this trigger regardless of who he targets with this action. Let's say Harrison uses Gather Intel on this Gearling and flips a 6 of Rams to make it happen. He wants the Mask trigger, so he cheats in a 5 of Masks from his hand. Harrison pushes the Gearling through himself towards Klaus Norwood and Hildegard, ending up about an inch away from them both. Klaus and Hildegard both make willpower duels. Klaus flips a 10 and passes, while Hildegard flips a 1 and fails. She gains Distracted plus 1. She could cheat, but decides not to. Because Harrison had the mask in his duel, he gets to use the Uncanny Valley trigger, and places himself into base contact with Harris J5, wherever that model is on the table. Harrison's final tactical action is also his bonus action. Remember that a model can usually take only one bonus action during its activation. Let's Fix That For You has a 2 inch range and a target number of 12 with a stat 6, so that means he has to flip or cheat in a 6 or better to make it happen. It also says Friendly Only, so it has to be used on a member of Harrison's crew, but does include Harrison himself. Just like Spycraft, Harrison can use this action drawing range and line of sight from any watchman on the table, which means he could heal any watchman anywhere by drawing line of sight from the other model and then targeting that same model. If he succeeds in reaching the target number, Harrison will flip another card to determine how much he heals the targeted model. A weak card of value 1 through 5 will heal 1, a moderate card of value 6 through 10 will heal 2, and a severe card with a value of 11 through 13 will heal 3. The black joker will heal nothing, while the red joker will heal severe plus 1, which in this case is 4. Unless you flip the black joker, which cannot be cheated, you always have the option of cheating in a better card from your hand if you don't like the card you flipped. Let's Fix That For You has two triggers. If Harrison gets a ram in the duel when he's reaching the target number, he can declare the Extra Supplies trigger. This increases the healing effect by plus one, regardless of what was flipped, except for the Black Joker, which cannot be modified. The Preparations trigger comes with a tome, and simply gives the targeted model focused plus one. Remember that other Watchmen models near the targeted model could also gain focus plus one with their isochronism abilities. Now we have Harris J5, the Enforcer of the Watchmen. His first ability is Armor plus one, which reduces all damage he suffers by one, regardless of the source of the damage. The big caveat on that is that Armor may not reduce damage to zero, so if J5 were to suffer only one damage, the Armor ability would not reduce it. J5 has the Isochronism ability which lets it duplicate conditions from other models as explained with Harrison Frodsham. It also has Extended Reach that prevents enemy models within 2 inches from taking attack actions when they charge. Check this out. A red cap from the Neverborn starter box is here, about 3 inches away from Harris J5. It charges past him at Harrison Frodsham, ending up in base contact with Harrison and within J5's 2-inch extended reach aura. The charge is a unique action that lets the model push up to its movement 
and then take an optional melee attack. The red cap can do the push, but cannot make the attack thanks to Harris J5's extended reach. The red cap may make a regular melee attack with its second action since extended reach applies only to melee attacks stemming from the charge action. J5's last ability is unique, which means no other model in the game has it. This takes effect as soon as you say you're activating Harris J5 and before it takes any actions. If a friendly master model or henchman is within 6 inches of J5 when he activates, he draws a card. Note that it does not say, may draw a card. So if there is some negative effect that happens because of drawing a card, J5 will not be able to avoid it. If Harrison Frodsham specifically is within 6 inches of J5 when it activates, you can choose either J5 or Harrison to move up to 3 inches if you want. Let's look at an example for clarity. Let's say you've gotten used to the game and you've expanded into another keyword. You're playing an M and S U keyword crew led by Tony Ironsides. You've included the captain in the crew as a henchman and you've got all four Watchmen keyword models as well. When Harris J5 activates, the first part of its ability takes effect if Tony Ironsides, a master, the captain, a henchman, or Harrison Frodsham are within six inches of Harris J5 when it activates, and he draws a card. If more than one are within six inches, nothing more happens. You don't get to draw a card for each of them. Then, since Harrison Frodsham is within six inches, you'd get to move him, or J5, up to three inches if you want. On the back of the card, we see that Harris J5 has only one attack action, Pendulum Swing. It gives him a 2-inch engagement range and has a stat of 5 with an embedded tome. This means that no matter what suit is flipped in the duel, you can always use the tome from the stat when declaring triggers. Let's look at that. Harris J5 is getting surrounded by grim models. He has two red caps in front of him and Klaus Norwood is sneaking up behind him. When J5 activates, he uses his pendulum swing on the nearest red cap which is just over an inch away. He flips a 10 of rams for a total of 15, and the red cap flips a 3 for a total of 8. The red cap doesn't cheat and loses the duel. Harris J5 now has his choice of triggers. The ram flipped gives the critical strike trigger, which increases the damage the attack inflicts. The tome from the stat gives the meteor hammer trigger, which lets J5 drop the blast marker from the attack anywhere within 4 inches of itself. This is what J5 chooses. Flipping a single card for damage due to the difference in their dual totals, J5 flips a 9 for moderate damage. That does 3 points of damage to the targeted red cap, and its armor ability reduces that by 1 to a total of 2 damage suffered. Normally, the blast marker would be placed in base contact with the targeted model, which J5 could still do to hit the other red cap behind the first one. Since he declared the Meteor Hammer trigger, J5 chooses to put the Blast Marker over here, overlapping Klaus Norwood's base and inflicting damage one tier lower than what the Red Cap suffered. Weak damage from this attack is 2, so that's what Klaus suffers. You can use the 50mm cutout in your measuring widget as a Blast Marker and watch video 209 for more details about Blast Markers and how they work. Looking at J5's tactical actions, we see that it has three, and two of them are bonus actions. Overwhelming Intricacy is a pulse action that radiates six inches out from the edge of J5's base. Pulses do not affect their sources, so J5 cannot use it on itself. It has a target number of 10 and a stat of 5, so J5 must flip or cheat a 5 or better to make it happen. If it works, Enemy models within range and line of sight of Harris J5 must make a willpower duel with a target number of 12. For those that fail, J5 can choose to push them up to 2 inches or give them distracted plus 1. You can choose individually for each model. You don't have to make one choice for all the models that fail the duel. The text on the card doesn't say enemy models, but models within range. This means that friendly models, members of Harris J5's crew, also need to make this duel. But here's the cool thing. If you don't want to flip the cards and waste them on willpower duels, 
you can say that your friendly models just relent to the action. Since it's generated by a friendly model, you don't have to flip cards, and you can choose for them to either push up to two inches or gain distracted, though you'll probably want to choose the push. Also keep in mind that the action says you may push or give distracted. If your models are right where you want them, they can relent to the action and still have nothing happen. Enemy models do not have the option to relent and must flip for the willpower duel. When Harris J5 flips or cheats to make this action happen, a mask in that duel will let him declare the never tell me the odds trigger. This trigger makes it harder for enemy models to resist by increasing the target number of the willpower duel from 12 to 14, as long as three or more models are within the six inch pulse. This can be any combination of friendly or enemy models, but remember that Harris J5 does not count as one of them. J5's other two tactical actions are both bonus actions, but J5 still cannot take both of them in the same activation since only one bonus action is allowed. But now it has options. Field repairs can target any model with the construct characteristic within three inches. As long as Harris J5 flips or cheats a six or better to reach the target number 12, the target heals up to three depending on the strength of the card Harris J5 flips next. In the starter box, this can be used on the Gearlings or Harris J5 since it doesn't say Other Construct. But if J5 is included in another crew later on, it can apply to any nearby model with the Construct characteristic. The other bonus action is Unwind. It doesn't require a flip, but it requires Harris J5 to have at least one condition. It could be one acquired through the Isochronism ability, or one like Burning or Distracted. Whatever it is, end the entire condition when you declare this action. Then, if you want, Harris J5 may take any general action other than Charge. This could be Interact, Disengage, Concentrate, Assist, Walk, or Slam. J5 doesn't have to take a general action though, so this bonus action could be used just to shake off a condition you don't want. The last models in the starter box are the two Gearlings. They are two distinct models, but they have identical stats, abilities, and actions. You'll see that they have a hiring limit of two, so even if you buy another starter box with two more Gearlings, you aren't allowed to have more than two in a crew at a time. One of the first things you may notice is that the defense stat has a mask embedded in it. We'll come back to that in a minute. Like Harris J5, the Gearlings have armor plus one, which reduces all damage they suffer by one, but not all the way to zero. They also have the Isochronism ability, which lets them duplicate conditions from other nearby models, as explained earlier. Their first new ability is Automatic Movement. This one says, after this model ends a move outside its activation, it gains shielded plus one, but only once per activation. How can it be once per activation, but be outside the Gearlings activation? This ability takes effect during the activations of other models, which is one of many things that makes Malifaux tricky to play. So how might the Gearling end a move outside its activation? Harrison Frodsham's A Cog in Its Place ability lets him push a friendly model whenever a pass token is used to skip an activation, so that would work. His Gather Intel tactical action could push the Gearling up to 5 inches, so that would count too. Even Harris J5's overwhelming intricacy tactical action can push the Gearling 2 inches, so that would also work. Some enemy model actions also could force the Gearling to move. No matter how it happens, if the Gearling moves outside of its activation, it gets the shielded plus one condition, but only once during the activation of the model that causes the movement. If Harris J5 used overwhelming intricacy twice to move nearby models, the Gearling could gain shielded only once, even if it wound up moving twice. Expert Getaway is another cool ability that works well with automatic movement. This one simply says that the Gearling can ignore terrain and models while moving. That means it can walk through walls, trees, severe terrain, and other models, but still cannot stop with its base overlapping another model or impassable terrain. This applies to every time the Gearling moves, 
so if another model causes the gearling to move, it can still move through other models in terrain. The last ability is what is called a resistance trigger. This is tied to the gearling's defense stat and says that when the gearling has a mask in its flip when using defense in an opposed duel, it can declare the leap aside trigger as long as it wins the duel. The text of the trigger doesn't say something like after resolving or when resolving, so it is understood to be after succeeding. Say this red cap swings its huge sickle at the gearling. The gearling loses the duel and suffers one damage after reducing for armor. Because it lost the duel, the gearling does not get to use the leap aside trigger. The red cap attacks again, and this time the gearling wins. Regardless of what suit is flipped in the duel, the gearling has a mask in its defense stat it can use. Since it won the duel, it can declare the leap aside trigger and place itself anywhere within three inches of where it currently is. The really good news is that a place counts as a movement, which can then give the gearling shielded plus one through its automatic movement ability as long as it hasn't already used it during that model's activation. On the back, we see the gearling has only one attack, Timekeeper's Tools. This gives it a one inch engagement range and does two or three points of damage. Note that the moderate and severe damage are both three, so there may not be an advantage to cheating on the damage flip trying to get more damage. If the gearling gets a crow in the duel, not the damage flip, while attacking an enemy model, it can declare the Synchronize Fate trigger which does any good only if the gearling itself has a condition it wants to give the enemy model. That would probably be something like burning, poison, or distracted, but could also vary depending on the needs of your crew. This could lead to creative choices with the isochronism ability in which the gearling takes on a harmful condition with the hopes of passing it on to an enemy model through this attack and trigger. That's kind of risky though. No matter what your gearling's condition value was, like burning plus 3 or poison plus 2, the opposing model gains it at just plus 1. The watch chain tactical action has an 8 inch range and a target number of 10, so the gearling must flip or cheat a 6 or better to make it happen since it has a stat 4. There must also be a piece of terrain within that 8 inches, but here's the tricky cool part. This can be a piece of terrain you put on the table at the start of the game, a terrain marker that another model dropped or created, or even an aura that counts as terrain, like Amonozako's Miasma of Boils and Flies. As long as it has one or more terrain characteristics, it counts as a piece of terrain. If the gearling succeeds in reaching its target number, it pushes itself up to 5 inches, its movement stat, toward that piece of terrain. It doesn't have to reach it, it just moves in that direction. Remember that the gearling can move through other models and terrain while moving thanks to expert getaway. Wherever it winds up, enemy models within two inches of the gearling then have to pass a target number 12 defense duel or else suffer two damage. What's really fun is the swift action trigger. If the gearling flips or cheats in a mask when performing the duel, it can declare swift action, do the entire watch chain action, and then do it again. It'll have to flip another card to reach the target number again, but then it gets to move and force the defense duels again. Remember that actions generated by triggers like this cannot declare triggers themselves, so there's no point in trying to get a mask in the second watch chain. Even if there are no enemy models nearby wherever the gearling winds up, this can be a fun way to get 5 or 10 inches of movement without taking the walk action, especially if it gets the gearling out of engagement. The gearling's bonus action is unwind, just like on Harris J5's card. It ends a condition it has, and then has a choice of taking a general action other than charge, but it has to have a condition to end first. Now that you understand how your models work together, practice playing a simplified game. This format also works very well in your friendly local game store for demo games. Set the table with a normal amount of terrain, as described in the core rulebook and also in video 301. Each player claims one standard deployment zone, which is an even strip across one side of the plane area, 8 inches from the table edge. 
It doesn't matter who goes first or sets their models on the table first, as long as no part of any model's base extends beyond the deployment zone. Watch all the videos in the 100 and 200 series so you have a grasp of the fundamentals before you play. Be sure to have corpse and scrap markers as your models will likely drop one or the other of these when they are killed. Some models also use them for special effects. Lastly, you'll need pass tokens to either skip activating a model as the balance of the game shifts or to pay for other special game effects depending on your crew. With that said, you'll play a full game of five turns, but with only four models in each crew, it won't take that long. You can play at just 25 soul stones, which will be all the models in your starter box, or you can play at 30 soul stones, which gives you a few extra for an upgrade or two and some soul stones left over for your soul stone pool. You might want to wait until your second or third game before adding in upgrades and soul stones. And for your first game, just focus on the abilities, actions, and basic game mechanics. You may also have learned that in games of a certain size, the crew leader gets to take three actions and a bonus action. That size is 50 soul stones. So at this 25 or 30 soul stone level, all models, even the crew leader, will take just two actions and a bonus action. Like regular games, there is no scoring victory points in turn one. In turns two through five, each player can score victory points in two ways. Kill an enemy model, or place a scheme marker into base contact with a piece of terrain that is on the enemy half of the table. You'll have to remove the scheme marker to score the point, but in this simplified game, you can score as many victory points as you're eligible each turn. If you kill one enemy model anywhere on the table, and then remove two scheme markers that you had placed next to terrain on the enemy side of the table, then you'd score three victory points that turn. At the end of the fifth turn, count up all your victory points and see who won. Be sure to show good sportsmanship and shake hands with your opponent after your game. After a few beginning games like this, look into the Henchman Hardcore format in Gaining Grounds and take your game to the next level. That's the introduction to the Arcanist Starter Box. Pick up a printable set of all the markers and tokens you need to play Malifaux in the Wargame Vault. If you haven't already, join our Patreon for early, ad-free access to all new content. And be sure to visit the Malifaux University gift shop for the latest in Malifaux-themed shirts, hoodies, drinkware, and more. Links are in the notes below. And remember, play friendly games, keep it simple, and have fun.